All right, and we are live. Hello, hello, and welcome to another Ask Databricks. So we've got another exciting topic in that we're going to dig into the depths of Unity Catalog. And I'm making lots of noise on myself. I'm just going to go mute myself. That's smart. Cool. So we want to learn all about essentially data governance, all of your questions about data governance, anything you want to know in the world of data governance is what we're talking about. So we've got Paul here today to help us answer all those questions. Hello, hello, Paul. Welcome. Hello, Simon. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, that's quite all right. Thanks for taking the time. Cool. So yeah, normal kickoff. Do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself, your role at Databricks, all that good stuff? Yeah, so I've been at Databricks almost five years. I kind of traveled through the company, um, started off with a, as a field engineer. So I used to work directly with customers and help them to implement Databricks. Uh, and latterly, I've been working on Unity Catalog as a PM for the last couple of years. All right, very cool. I mean, so how did you how did you get into tech? Well, what's your journey? Why why what brought you to the the pillars of looking after Unity? Yeah, quite uh, quite some responsibility there. So my my journey uh, started up in the University of Edinburgh, actually. So I was a pure math grad, looking for a way to basically you know use all of those proofs and theorems that I'd learned about out in the real world. And I landed in this technology consulting job. And essentially, my first you know week on the job. I was put in front of a bank and they said, we think we have a fraud problem. Um, and they thought that they had, you know, criminal gangs who are making up identities and applying for credit cards. And we basically implemented this algorithm, you know, this was 15, 20 years ago that would just like churn through their data one record at a time and try and find areas where people are intentionally manipulating their identities. And I just thought this was like the most classical use of data, right? Essentially, you're like churning through masses amount of data and producing these like highly visual results of like bad people, you know, people doing bad things. Mm. Uh, so that really got me involved in data. And uh, since then, you know, I've remained in the industry since. Awesome. So after that, that start of looking into people doing naughty things, you thought, right, data governance is where it's at. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. It all starts with data governance, right? Totally. Um, <laughs> no, is, is it what every kid dreams of doing when they grow up is basically to, to get into data governance. But uh, in all seriousness, I think like uh, I, I went through various startups. I worked with um, Mike Stonebreaker and Andy Palmer, who invented a lot of the kind of modern database technology. And we were trying yeah. to basically, uh, we're in the early wave of data preparation software. So it's all about how can we make data clean and metadata standards high and things like that. So that really sort of piqued my interest in data governance and making sure that you know data is high quality before the users get mm. used to, uh, get access to it. I mean, it's a uh, much as I occasionally joke about data governance being boring. It's so incredibly important, and it's really funny we're we're experiencing this huge renaissance in data governance at the moment. And like we're talking to some clients about it the other day, in that they're like, "What? Why are we suddenly caring about this this stuff? But well, we used to do this stuff." We did stuff years ago. Why is it suddenly trendy again? And it's maturity, right? It's the fact that the lake house was very immature. People kind of lost sight of the kind of that level of maturity had to look after things. We've reached a point now when we're, it's doing everything so good. And all the things like data mesh and all the, the ideas of distribution and federated ownership, data governance is massively important to get that stuff right. And there's this huge focus on it. Totally. Yeah, I was rereading... Um you know, the paper on Lake House by Reynolds and Matei and Michael. And I don't get to say this often, but I think they miss something in it, right? Like if you, <laughs> if they're watching it. So, you know, if you search for governance, there's like maybe three or four mentions of it, but there's no, there's no section, there's no drill down onto it, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that essentially, you know, we all realize this, this thing that we, we open up these open data standards, we put all of these different use cases on top of it. Uh, but these were use cases like data science and data warehousing that had never been in the same platform before, right? So and now you've got worlds colliding, but governance colliding as well, right? So you had the data warehousing crew that were used to basically setting ACLs and doing column and row level access. And then you had the data science folks who were like, what's governance? You know, like, doesn't that just slow me down? Um, and so we had to really, so that's what, when we thought about Unity, and this is why we called it Unity actually, is because we were trying to unify governance across all of those different uh, use cases and, and data personas. Cool, very, very cool. I mean, I guess that, that, first, that first question was, what is Unity Catalog and why did you build it? And I guess you, you've answered a lot of that there. <laughs> yeah, I mean, just to like restate kind of what it is, if it's not clear from the intro here, I mean, 
uh, Unity is a tool that helps you implement data governance on your lake house for both data and AI assets. And like one really, you know, just to kind of ground it, one really simple example of that is is like access control, which is one one part of governance. Um, you know, like Simon, you're in UK, I'm in the US here, we probably like are allowed to see different data if in the same organization, right? So Unity has this really simple way of just saying like, Simon is allowed to see this data, Paul's allowed to see this data, and wherever you go in the lake house, um, that's going to be adhered to, right? And there's sort of no back doors around it or require a special config or anything like that. It just, it just data governance that works. So that that's one really simple example of, of Unity. I mean, so I think giant, giant question obviously came up in advance. We knew this question was going to come up in advance. I think the, the, the nerdy question people uh, keep asking is, so we're calling it Unity, and there's two sides to it. So one, why can't one Metastore see data from another Metastore if we're trying to have unified governance? But also, why can we only have one Metastore in a given region if they're entirely different, owned by different people, and we have dev test and you know, prod and actual reasons why we should separate it? How should people think about that? Yeah, that's a good question. So before we get into it, like I think we have a problem in tech that we don't really have so many words, right? Like <laughs> better store, right? We completely, we always completely mm -hmm. over overload these terms. Um, and you know, if you think about what a meta store was in in Hive, you know, it's essentially a central repository where you register metadata, and that's why we called it a, a meta store in Unity. But the the usage pattern in Hive was it was quite interesting. So what we saw when we spoke to customers about how they implemented Hive, they would have, uh, you know, they'd set up multiple Hive meta stores, okay, and they would they would use this fact in Spark that you can only access one meta store from any Spark session. Mm -hmm. This kind of isolation going right. So maybe in their prod environment they'd have a prod meta store, in their dev environment they'd have a, a dev meta store, right. And this works well, you know, you decide this on day one, it works well for three months, right? And then suddenly these rules that you thought were hard and fast start to degrade, right? So you get an ML team and they're suddenly like, well, we need to train on production data because our mm -hmm. algorithm is not going to do it instead. So like what we saw is that then people started to kind of get into these hybrid zones where they, they, they thought they had these hard and fast rules. And then they had to try and kind of uh, back out of them by maybe defining the same piece of data in two meta stores, okay? Uh, which screws up kind of access control and auditing and all of that kind of stuff. So we wanted to do it a little bit differently with uh, with Unity. We wanted to start with the assumption that Metastore is this basically logical construct and it's a place to register your metadata, but then would offer the same kind of isolation that you would achieve between Metastores, but within a Metastore in Unity. So there was a couple of examples of that, and you know we can kind of get into this. There's a feature called uh, catalog to workspace binding that allows you to say, you know, this catalog can only be seen from this particular workspace. So you can get some of these rules, and there's there's a bunch more stuff I can talk about there as well. Um, so that's the that's kind of the Uber point, um, and it, and then it means that you can always kind of change your mind. Um, you can always kind of you know you've got these catalogs today it's only bound you know you can only access it from the prod environment but in the future you know maybe your requirements change and you need to expose it in a read only manner to a different workspace and you can you can do that in a really natural way so that's the that's the answer to the first part of the question simon you're probably wondering about the second part though <laughs> <laughs> the regional the regional thing right so we we basically say we want to uh, the, the 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 question here is really uh, once you define your your meta store, that's that's for a particular region, right? US West two, mm -hmm. you can attach yep. it to workspaces in the same region. Um, when we spoke to customers about this, and we, we continue to get feedback on this, um, we we always found that people wanted to be really intentional about their regional access, right? Like the same example I kind of opened this with, like you're in London or in UK, and uh, you know, you, I probably shouldn't be accessing the same data as what you are, right? Or when I create a data set, then there should be no way that that gets transported over to, to your region. So we started with this really intentional construct of, of, a, of a region, basically. Um, and then we, we decided to offer a pattern, which is delta sharing. So if, if you really want to read across region, which some folks do, some folks have this requirement, then you just take this really intentional path to do that. Um, yeah, but the, yeah, there's lots of lots of stuff where 
continuing to discuss and there's kind of more stuff in the roadmap that will help sort of managing access across these different regions. Um, yeah. And I, th I think that makes sense. You know, and I just think, I, I think the thing that uh, some people are missing that kind of is just that, that final missing link in terms of the, just, a, I, I don't know if it's in there. I don't know if I've seen it. Uh, like a, a really easy, you know, as part of the Unity catalog you, like UI is part of the within Metastore to go, oh, actually share this with that other Metastore. Just, and use Delta sharing between things, facilitate it. But I think that's, that is just the final missing piece. And then it all makes sense. The catalog workspace binding is great. That's now just whenever we create a catalog, we just auto bind it to whatever environment it's in. Solves the problem. All makes sense. It's all great. So a little, a little button to say, share this with another meta store and just, just make a version of it queryable across. And I think then it's unified. Finally <laughs> unified. That's what we want. <laughs> all right. So we do have a pile of questions. We're getting lots of questions in, which is great. Um, so lineage. Uh, how do you get end-to-end -end lineage with Unity Catalog? What's the best way to actually see it? And how does that work? Yeah, it's a good question. It's close to my heart, this one. Um, so, yeah, when we were researching what we should build as part of, of Unity, that we started with like the, the bare basics, like the accessing and auditing and things like that. And then it became really clear that like lineage is super important for data governance, mm -hmm. right? Like you want to be able to do impact analysis to say, you know, I'm going to take this column out of a table, what's going to happen downstream, you know, or maybe it's just from a discovery perspective, like I'm using this table, but like what sources does it actually pull from? Um, so this is super important. So we decided to basically implement like an automatic system of lineage capture um, because, you know, we looked at state of the art and state of the art was basically parsing SQL scripts and trying to figure out kind of the connections between between objects. But we operate cross language. You know, we have all of these different data personas. Um, so we, we implemented it at a lower level and essentially it works really cool. Uh, you just write code and we infer lineage. It's like as simple as that. So um, today, and I can show a visual on the screen actually, uh, if you- Yeah, give me a second. There we go. So today we actually have a lot of different entities that are covered in lineage. Um, so if I go to a quick example here, um, So this is, a, this is a lineage graph that has been automatically inferred, right? And what we're seeing here is essentially data being loaded from a, a volume, which is this way to basically store and access unstructured data. Uh, it's being loaded into a table, okay? Just a regular table in the lake house. It's been joined with a federated source from Postgres and, uh, and and put into this feature table, which is a machine learning construct. And then we're training a model with it, right? So we're actually like just with these, you know, five nodes on the graph, we're seeing this, this transformation of data from, uh, you know, basically from raw files all the way through to models through federated sources and things like that. Um, so we're really excited about this. We're, you know, like one of the, the nice things like is we keep on adding entities into kind of access control on the Unity side. We also add them into the lineage graph. Um, so you get this really nice end-to-end -end, uh, sort of graph uh, going here. And we're, you know, the, the future of this is we're going to have things like model serving endpoints and, and various other ML assets in here. Because um, we really like our mental model for this is this describes the relationships between all of your different uh, entities. In, in the lake or in the lake house. Um, so yeah, hopefully that answers the question. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, and certainly that is, um, it's one of those elements where it's just getting closer and closer to the actual, you know, the complete final story, right? Yeah. Because when, when Lineage first came out and you could do a column level lineage in between just Spark tables is still great and actually better than a lot of what you can do elsewhere. Yeah. But yeah, it felt like, the data had to be in the first layers of your lake before you could see it. So bringing volumes in, bringing those federated areas, just it is expanding it back and giving you that much better picture of it. Yeah. So people haven't been playing with it recently. Definitely check out volumes in terms of that way of sucking it in. And it's yeah, really. Yeah. I, do, I do have a follow up from LinkedIn. Oh please. Saying, um, will you see store lineage information and will it be available in purview? So what are the plans in terms of UC purview? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> So, like, generally, our, our strategy here is, you know, we, like, Daybricks, we, we're committed to open standards here. Like, this is the paper that I referenced before is all about openness, right? And 
we we make all of the metadata you put in Unity completely open, right? So that's the the actual table metadata. There's these sets of tables called the inf the information schema, um, which gives you like the state of the system. And then there's a bunch of system tables, right? And there's actually a system table that describes the relationships between all of these entities. Um, so every time you run a query, basically a record pops into the system table and says that you know table one was transformed into table two via this notebook. So we've exposed all of uh, these to, to our partners and Purview uh, currently integrating these lineage tables into, the, into their product. Um, and, and same for like other uh, catalog products as well. So we have really great partnerships with you know, the Calibras, the, the Atlans, the Alations, uh, you know, we're, we're fully committed to kind of that ecosystem. Very cool. There's uh, another question which I think has been answered in the chat, but it's a good one to kind of dive in and talk about which is um, automatic data discovery. So it's some of the things that some of those big, huge, expensive governance tools kind of do, but that kind of identifying PII data, just all like saying, oh, actually, you've got some sensitive data there. Are you aware that you've got exposed sensitive data? So yeah. what, what's that story? How does that work in, inside of uh, Unity? Yeah, so this is one area that we uh, we're really really excited about. So at the last conference, we, we announced uh, Lakehouse Monitoring. Right, and we think this is a we, we took a we took a look at this problem where essentially you know the ML team were thinking about this. They were thinking about monitoring models, right? And what that really means, it was like monitoring tables of inference or results, right? Mm. And we basically thought, well, this is this is like the lake house in action, right? Unification. We could actually apply the same techniques to lots of different problems. Um, so what we're doing right now is we're extending lake house monitoring, so it doesn't only kind of do model monitoring and that kind of stuff. It can do data quality analysis on just regular non-inference tables. And then it can also do PII detection, OK? Um, and this is going to be, there's a lot to use case I'm really excited about this. Like, it obviously feeds into kind of an overall ABAC strategy to be able to mm -hmm. tag, automatically tag and then, uh, you know, mass columns and things like that, which is definitely in the plans. Uh, like. I love the the combination of basically lake house monitoring and lineage as kind of the ultimate like data observability tool, right? Like lineage, you're trying to ask why something happened. Uh, and then what you always do is just like walk back and say like, well, what did happen? So I can see all of the tables uh, that, are, that are upstream of this one, like which one turned uh, into bad data quality or where did PII leak into one of these tables? So I'm really excited about that kind of confluence of lineage and of lake house monitoring. Yeah, very cool. All right, I'm going to switch tech. I've got some uh, best practice questions. So what is a good practice for managing ownership of objects? Because pretty key, that idea of responsibilities and ownership and who's looking after what and trying to convince people that they should take ownership of data has been a long thing that we've been trying to do in the industry for a long time. But how yeah. do you think of that in terms of Unity? Yeah, it's a good question. And it, it kind of boils down to the the sort of architecture of your catalogs, right? Um, and, and your different tables within it. So what we found as a, as a best practice is basically you align a catalog to like a data domain or a, a type of data. So maybe it's like, you know, I don't know, your your parts division or something like that, or the telemetry data from your products or something. Um, and then you also uh, associate a an SDLC environment to it as well. So like maybe telemetry underscore prod is kind of what we see, see a lot. Okay. And then it's super important who you choose as that kind of the owner of that mm -hmm. catalog, because they basically become this sort of uber admin of all the data in there, right? Like you can think of this catalog as almost like this, isolated unit where they can uh, act on and give access and, and do lots of stuff on, on that catalog. Um, so naturally, yeah, it, sh it should be kind of like the domain data owner um, that has that has access to that. And then within that, you know, you're free to sort of do some more delegation. So maybe a scheme, a schema we typically see is like more of a project or maybe it's even a team and it's like a team sandbox. And then you have your, you know, your your team leads or managers, uh, kind of as the owner of that, and they can set up all the same defaults and that kind of stuff. Uh, but yeah, it's it's definitely a it's a it's a, it's a really good question because it it's worth being intentional about who owns your your things. Uh, and as you said, it's something that like you know, there's probably political struggles going on about who data ownership and all that kind of stuff. But uh, yeah, that's the way that I think about it. Cool. Bean. 
poked by several directions with a, with an interesting question. And it's funny because we were having this debate inside AA literally just yesterday. Um, so with anything going on in terms of you see if you're setting things up, should you go manage tables or external? And I used to very strongly tell everyone just to go external tables because you don't want to wipe your SQL layer and then lose all your data. And the lake and your SQL layer are very different things. And with Unity, that's no longer the case, right? We kind of just more seeding ownership of that to the Unity catalog level. But what are the benefits of using managed versus external? And what do you recommend for people starting out? Yeah. So firstly, the, the use case that we typically see for external tables is I have you know, a petabyte of data you know, that I've had before I've produced, and I need a way to basically register that as a metadata operation in Unity. So one of the really strong use cases is, is pulling in data that you've, you've defined before, okay? Um, and then manage tables, I see them as the easy button, right? Like you, you don't, you just basically associate a storage location to a, you know, you say this catalog will store its data at this S3 or ADLS path or mm -hmm. UCS path. And then all the data just goes in there, right? Like you don't have, you don't leave it to the individual data engineer to basically configure that um, access. So uh, th there's a few things that we, we do currently for, for managed tables, a few benefits. So things like if you drop your table accidentally, you can undrop it, right? Because we kind of manage uh, the drop semantics. Um, and also, we're able to do some some kind of auto tuning of of these managed tables as well, uh, because we essentially see all of the kind of uh, paths to and the rights to those to those tables, so we can kind of cleverly schedule some some maintenance on them. So my uh, my advice is certainly to to use uh, managed tables uh, going forward um, if you have uh, extra like existing data, define them as external tables and bring them in. And we're we're always looking for ways like we we I would prefer it if there was just one table type. Let's just say that like we call them tables, right? Um, so you know the direction that we'll try and go with Unity is you know you brought in this petabyte of data in as an external table, we'll uh, we'll try and make more of those managed table features available on external tables as well. Um, and you know there's a few, a few bits of tech we have to solve there, but that's the kind of direction of travel. Yeah, and, and for me, that, that's the kind of advice I've been giving people, you know, and that's, that's what we've been looking at internally, where most things are external currently because we could be using DataRx, we could be using other tools, we could be using Power BI. It's essentially the lake's in the middle and lots of things are going through it. But as soon as you say, oh, but if it's managed, we'll start looking after it, part, part of it for you. Great. That's a good reason to go ahead and just go, yeah, great. Tune my tables, look after my tables, give me a, a an undrop. And just all, all of that feature suddenly being, rather being, it's kind of up to you, you can go either way. It's now a oh, there's a clear benefit one way or the other. Obviously, if you then put it put all that feature into external, great, we'll be back to it. It doesn't really matter to it whichever way you want. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, I think manage will always stay ahead, right? There's just yeah. it's, some stuff we can't do with external, but, uh, you know, th there's just this huge case of, oh, I've got lots of external data to pull in. So, like, we want to help people with that data as well. Yeah, very cool. And... I'm looking forward to it managing more of my life and I can just put my feet up. Sounds good. <laughs> okay. So big, big question. Um, how, do, how does someone go about setting up UC in an enterprise? How do you go about rolling it out? If you've got lots of data spread out already, like how do you, how do you even start? How do you even start? It's a good question. Um, so typically you go through, there's kind of, you know, like every enterprise is coming from a slightly different place. So it's sort of, uh, you know, it depends a little bit, but it's, it's basically these four steps, right? You've got to think about your identity model, right? Because we're basically moving from this, this place where each workspace was like, a, you know, it's individual fiefdom, right? And identity was managed there to a place where if we want to get this cross workspace access, you need to think about global identity, right? So the really tactical thing there is just to kind of, educate uh, yourself on, on the identity model and basically move your, your workspace skim to the account skim or, or whatever pipes you have connected. So that's, that's kind of the first step. Um, the second step is kind of what we we're just talking about. Like think about the, uh, the tables, right? And uh, you know, you've got to start by setting up basically connections. So we have these objects called external locations and storage mm -hmm. credentials, which is basically a way of Unity being able to connect to your cloud storage, okay? Um, so you set those up and then and then you've got to think about actually copying the metadata over as well. 
Um, so we provide a couple of tooling tools there. We have a sync tool that does a basically a metadata copy and an upgrade wizard uh, in the UI as well that helps you to get your metadata in. Um, and then what we typically see people do is start thinking about just moving over your consumers of data. Okay, so maybe leave your jobs kind of running as is right into mm -hmm. your tables and then uh, your consumers start to operate on the kind of reflected version in, in, in UC. Um, and then, and then, yeah, basically go through your high value jobs and the ones that you want the unity benefits for, like, you know, lineage and stuff like that. And, uh, and start that process of basically making sure the job can run against the unity version of the table. So, you know, there's obviously a lot of details, uh, there, but those are kind of the four main steps that we typically go through. Yeah, it makes sense. And I think it, it kind of like, it reassures people that you can enable unity and then it not like everything's going to suddenly stop working so you can enable things and then just slowly migrate things piecemeal it's an it's an iteration it's not a big bang it's something that you can work towards once you've done the initial setup yeah um that, that's definitely a really good practice not not to not to try and boil the ocean and just start you know cut your consumers over and make sure that new use cases are using unity right the other thing to mention is we've seen this pattern where you know sometimes sometimes the motivation for adopting unity is different and sometimes it's, I want to do delta sharing because I want to share this data externally. And in that case, like a really common pattern is just to turn on Unity, which you said is like a three minute operation. And then um, and then just start putting data, you know, copying data that you want to share into Unity and using it as basically this delta sharing hub. So in that case, you don't actually have to go through the four steps that I just said. For delta sharing, it's as simple as just turning on Unity and putting whatever tables you want to share in there. Uh, so we've seen that as a pattern if folks want to start get, uh, get up and running with specific features. All right, very cool. And there's one that there's a question that kind of links in that kind of already been answered, which is um, does the role of Unity Catalog evolve within Databricks to manage storage access for notebooks getting into things and that kind of stuff? I think we've already answered it. Kind of already has with external locations, with volumes, and all of those things baked into it. So right, yeah. yeah. Good. <laughs> <laughs> We've seen Unity is, you know, it's become this sort of foundation for lots of features in, in Databricks because everything starts with good governance, right? If you think about search, like, it's in, you know, when you can pull in N different, you know, Hive metastores, it's hard to do into one workspace. It's really hard to have clean metadata and actually do any kind of search and discovery. So we, we've basically seen like Unity being this foundation for lots of teams building features. Uh, yeah. I mean, I know I'll ask a slightly awkward question in that there has been a slight blocker in lots of huge organizations in terms of trying to find the person who is the global AD admin to let you turn on Unity for the first time. I mean, how should people, how should people approach that? Because that's, I mean, they only, they're only needed literally to log on to the account console once and set the administrator. But we found that's been a huge blocker in gigantic multi-country uh, enterprises. How, yeah. how do people think about getting over that initial hurdle? Yeah. Um, Glad you asked about that. So we're actually doing a lot of development right now. In so right now, when you set up Unity, you set up your workspace, and then uh, you go second step. You go find your global admin, and you know bang your head against the wall or whatever, and uh, try and find them. Right, clap three times, see if they turn up. Um, so what we're actually doing is is building Unity and the enablement into the workspace creation process. Okay. So there's a new feature that's going to start rolling out, which is basically when I launch a workspace, I get Unity. Okay, I don't have to go and find an account admin. And we're doing all these kind of safe isolation mechanisms to make sure that like you get a catalog that's tied to that workspace that can only be accessed from there, and you've got a storage location which is tied to that catalog, um, and you can operate without an account admin. So this is the future. We just see like Unity becomes a part of Databricks, and it's just basically built-in governance uh, for Databricks. Um, so we're I think at, at that point, there's people like cheering out in the streets. <laughs> yeah. <Awesome. laughs> so kind of Unity by default is is the future look of things. Yeah, hundred uh, percent. You you know we we're seeing this like as I said before, like all of these features kind of build on Unity. The, the you know unity needs to be on for all workspaces so we're trying to help folks do that yeah very very cool especially with just how much is now baked in like lakehouse assistance and all that kind of stuff needing unity enabled 
just making it so it's easy for everyone to go on it is just going to bring so many people to it, which means they'll do governance by default. <laughs> exactly. Awesome. Uh, a few other like some smaller ones following on from some of the comments from earlier. So um, ABAC. So if we're doing attribute-based access control, um, is there a performance hit? Uh, should people kind of how do people think about using it? Is that something you see just all over the place in the future? Yeah, ABAC's an interesting one. I mean, so we we started with our column and row level access controls. So you can you can do that today, right? It's in public preview. Everyone can get access to that. You can say Simon isn't allowed to see this particular column. So that's the start of it. You've also seen tags. So we have like basically key value tags uh, mm -hmm. that you can define in Unity now. And ABAC's about bringing uh, these two features together, at least in, in phase one of, of ABAC. Um, so we're looking to do that uh, you know, in, in our short-term roadmap here. Um, I, I see, you know, it depends on the type of organization. Some folks are like, I need column and row level access, and that, you know, that's th that's that's what my lake is going to be secured by. Um, other companies are like, you know, table level is fine for me. So we, yeah. we kind of see, you know, I, I, I think that in, in regards to your question about how how much adoption there'll be, like I think it's it's not every company needs to worry about kind of a back, but um, certainly there's some uh, some strong use cases for it. Very cool. All right. Probably another follow on question from when we're talking about purview. Uh, it's, it's much newer question. How's Unity Catalog going to work with Fabric? Ah, Fabric. Yeah, I love Fabric. So we, you know, like Fabric is is adopting the the lake house pattern, mm -hmm. right? So we're, we're we're thrilled about this. So like this is what the papers that we've been talking about and pushing out. Um, so yeah, like our uh, we're working really closely with the with the Microsoft team on making sure that you know like the dream of the lake house is that you can put all your data into this open is open format. And then you can, uh, you know, you basically get your your choice, right? That's like that's the dream. Uh, mm -hmm. So we're really working really closely with the fabric team on on how how this all looks together. Um, yeah, but we're really involved in those conversations. So is is there ever a time where uh, Unity will be able to discover delta tables? So you know, if you attached a new like sort of uh, a, a, not a volume, a new external location, etc. Right, here's a new lake that's already full of a lot of stuff just to do a scan and go, oh, well, there's actually already 200 tables in there. Let's uplift and do it, rather than the user having to go through and register that table, register that table, register that table. Yeah, definitely. We're, yeah, in terms of scalability, and we don't think just think about Fabric. So there's actually, there's one really exciting project I'm th we're thinking about here. So we, we've seen how, you know, we're at the point now where you can point Databricks at Postgres or Snowflake, and mm -hmm. it scans and pulls that in, and then you can use Unity as the governance layer on top of it. Um, and you know we're we're basically checking off these federation targets, right? So you know in the future we're thinking about one thing is high federation federation where maybe you've got a glue meta store, and you want to just like register that in Unity and have it crawl and and access it. Uh, maybe Fabric comes in as that. Like, I'm not kind of committing here, but like that's the kind of conversations we're having. So we totally see this vision of the future where, um, yeah, data is just kind of being discovered automatically by Unity, and uh, and then you get to manage access to it all in this one central place. Yeah, very cool. Um, so speaking speaking of future and new things and things that are happening, um, so all things like uh, generative AI models and all the the newer LLM kind of things that's coming in. So the kind of the new wave of artifacts that people are now uh, having to think about, uh, how do they fit in? What are they going to look like? How are they going to be part of the governance model? Yeah, so we've already seen, you know, when we think about kind of AI in, in Unity and our strategy there, um, we've already seen this, you know, we, you can have models in, in Unity, right? And that will continue to kind of like these Gen AI, Gen AI models as well. Um, and then I think the the really interesting bit about the Gen AI, AI specifically is like the both the, the serving right, and uh, mm -hmm. we'll, we'll get those kind of represented in Unity as well. But I, I also think the really important bit here, you know, we're seeing increasing regulations. Uh, trust the governance PM to bring bring ML back to governance, but <laughs> um, like we're seeing increasing regulations with with like machine learning and lots of activity in Europe and stuff like that. And like we think it's going to be really important to have you know th these these Gen AI models like well governed 
And like part of that is kind of like, how did you train it, right? Which is a lineage question really. Like, how do you know that the data that you, you pumped into this model wasn't copyrighted? Um, and how can you protect yourself for like the next few years that you know exactly where, how your model was trained and then who's accessing it and have an audit log and stamps of kind of who's tampered with that model. So we're really interested about this kind of intersection of ML and, and governance, or at least I am. <laughs> yeah, no, it makes a lot of sense. Um, so another, another, another quick follow up on some stuff. So one of the more recent things that changed is the ability to combine two of the big flagship uh, Databricks things. Delta Live Tables and Unity Catalog can now finally work together. Um, yeah, how do they work together and any limitations still remaining? Yeah, yeah, this, this is a good one. So uh, yeah, you can now define your DLT pipeline and have all of those tables in your pipeline uh, be governed by Unity, get all the benefits. So like things like Lineage. So Lineage uh, was very apparent in DLT. You know, you basically define your pipeline by defining the, the Lineage. Uh, but we also merge it with a broader lineage, right? So if you have a DLT table that's then consumed and sort of done in, in the rest of Spark, then uh, a Databricks will kind of join those, those lineage graphs together. Um, so lots of good stuff. We now have, uh, we have a, a nice way to basically get your legacy pipelines from DLT into, into kind of the new world with Unity as well. So there's a preview of right now, that right now. So if you reach out to your account reps or whatever, they can get you kind of enabled with that. Um, and yeah, the the couple the couple of things the team are working on is kind of making like the DLT tables like work well with kind of some of the sharing features um, as well in Unity. Cool. Very cool. Got a got another back to governance and process question. Please. So, uh, what best practices for backup and disaster recovery in terms of data and metadata when using UC? Yeah. So again, like we're all of the metadata in, in Unity is, is completely open and you can take it and do what do what you like with it, right? Like there's been many different there's been methods in Databricks in the past that basically uh iterate kind of automated dumps of metadata and kind of restore into other workspaces. Um and we, we offer the APIs that you can do that kind of stuff in, in Databricks. Um, but we're actually really interested in in kind of making that process a little bit easier. So just to kind of tease some stuff, um, we're looking at basically a DR solution that will kind of not rely on so many automated scripts and be a little bit more mm. of a kind of push button solution. So that's one uh, area of investment that we're we're definitely looking at right now. Very cool. Life's just going to get easier and easier for all of us. <laughs> So on the, on that note, I mean, yeah, I guess so. Away from some of the questions, like what are the what are the features that are coming up that you're super excited about, or what are the what are the big things that you are you can't wait to kind of well announce if you're allowed to. <laughs> At least kind of uh, what are you excited about that's in the pipeline? Yeah, so there's a there's a couple of kind of short term things I'll I'll call out here, um, which I know you know probably some customers are watching will uh, they probably know who they are and they've asked me for these so. <laughs> like one one thing, the the catalog the catalog bindings we've seen really great adoption of this feature. We think it's critical. Uh, we're introducing basically a read only catalog binding type, so you can say this production data uh, in this catalog can be read only from a development environment. So that's going to roll out in the next couple of weeks, actually. So you'll see that in your workspace. Um, we're extending a lot of the isolation mechanisms, so things like bindings on external locations and storage credentials. Lots of customers have been asking that. Again, pretty pretty tactical, but I know a lot. it's important to a lot of customers here as well. Um, on the kind of more long-term vision here, um, there's there's a lot of investments. And you know, there's, there's kind of some investments we made as a company for acquisitions of, of companies and so on that are going to push us in a certain direction. And you know, we're really thinking about, um, it kind of came up earlier in the conversation around regional access. We're really thinking about how we can uh, provide this kind of single governance playing cross region, you know, cross cloud um, and cross system. And there's kind of three big pillars of this we're thinking about. So one is, you know, just the access control. Like I set mm. a set of maybe ABAC rules or whatever that kind of percolate down to all of these kind of different hubs. Um, the second is from a, like a governance reporting perspective. Like how how can I be alerted or how can I monitor kind of the health of my entire ecosystem? 
Um, and then the, the third is from a discovery and kind of marketplace perspective as well. So we obviously launched kind of this, this external marketplace um, and folks saw it and they're like, I want that. I want that internally, right? Like, so uh, we've had a lot of conversations like that where, you know, it might be beneficial to kind of have this kind of uh, internal version of, of the marketplace where lots of data uh, producers can kind of certify their assets and put them in these and then and then come down. So that, that's kind of a, a sneak peek of some of the longer term stuff that, mm. that we're looking at. I mean, that, that must, that's very cool. Certainly working with lots of uh, financial services clients, the um, data risk marketplace itself, the amount of financial services data that's there for free to just go, oh, yeah, we'll just get those data sets rather than someone bundles it, puts it in FTP, you build an ETL and bring it in is, uh, life is so much easier now. <laughs> but yeah, the idea of an internal internal marketplace, kind of like we're saying in terms of being able to say, share this from one region to another when it's appropriate. Yeah, I can see I can see lots of users actually sort of picking that up and wanting to run with it. Nice. Awesome. Um, one of the questions follow up, which I think we've kind of answered, but just to be very, very clear about, um, What's the integration between MLflow and Unity Catalog on the roadmap looking like? Yeah, so we've we've done we've had a bunch of investment already to basically yeah models can be stored in Unity right like as a as an asset, um, and this solved like a big problem that we saw with MLflow before, which was people like MLflow again was like this workspace specific thing, and people had to you know maybe they'd set up the central MLflow instance and sort of propagate metadata to it, so we've uh, we've seen we've seen mlflow have a lot of benefits of just having unity as this way to uh man or the really the model registry um kind of store these things centrally um yeah and then all of the new kind of ai features around model serving and that kind of stuff are going to be fully integrated with unity work really well with uh with unity and be visualized in that end-to-end -end lineage you know which uh i think is super super compelling and, and important yeah, absolutely. This is very cool. Uh, one, one random question. Um, I, I want to meet the person who's asking this question to go, why? Which is the hard limits that we've got in terms of a thousand catalogs inside a, uh, a meta store. Are they hard limits or can they be increased? Yeah, we're, we're, we can... We can we can help we can help customers out who uh, who need to increase these limits. Look, we we want to encourage like best practices by basically putting in some limits so that people quit, you know, sort of come up with a rational architecture. And this is like kind of standard yeah. practice, right? Uh, but yeah, if there's specific reasons why folks are needing more than a thousand, then uh, we should have that conversation. Yeah, fair. Because I think when I first saw the limits and it was a thousand tables and you're allowed a thousand schemas, each of which have a thousand tables and you're allowed a thousand catalogs, which that's quite a lot of assets that you're securing and managing. It's fair. There's a lot of big companies out there. Yeah. But uh, yeah. <laughs> Be interesting to know how that's working. Cool. All right. So I think most of the questions I think we've actually managed to cover. Uh, there's one final one that we had on there, just in terms of how should people think about volumes. I think there's questions about can you are you ever going to allow creation of tables in volumes? I think the answer is no. <laughs> but just in terms of shaping how people should actually think about it. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Good. So vo firstly, volumes are the way to kind of just manage access to like unstructured data. Just maybe they're just files before you put structure around them, or maybe they are audio and, and video files and things like that. And our mental model for this is you've got these things called external locations. And this says, you know, this S3 path, here's a way to access it for Unity, okay? And our mental model is those are more kind of admin-y objects, right? Like you set these up, they've got fairly, they've got very wide access to swaths of your, your cloud storage system. And then what you do is you chop them up into tables and volumes, okay? And you give your individual users and teams access to those assets versus the, the external location. So we really see them as kind of a peer. Hopefully that kind of mental model says, you've got, like the hierarchy is your external uh, location, you can put in those tables or volumes. So tables and volumes are really peers of each other. Um, so to answer this specific question, yeah, we, we, do, we uh, we prefer not to kind of allow the creation of tables in volumes because then you get this really wonky hierarchy, which I know you'll not of you will uh, you'll you'll thank me for, where you have tables both being like a 
sibling of uh, a volumes and a child and you get into lots of kind of conflicts there um so that's that's that, that's my answer there and ho hopefully that kind of <laughs> it i mean it, it all it all makes sense for me so like we uh for all of our architectures we tend to have like a a completely unstructured landing blob and then we pick it up and from that point on it's delta tables and it's structured and we're evolving data and it's all it's all well managed and that we would never have a, a table in that landing because it's it's just people sending us random data. It could be vendors shipping things over. It's we never think about that as having structure in there. Even if someone was sending us lots of lovely parquet and it was lovely and structured and it never went wrong. I've also never seen that happen. But you know, theoretically, if someone was consistent with the data they were sending, it's after that point that you've actually put it into your structured table. So we don't even think of it that way. Certainly that's how we see it. I think that's very fair yeah i like it cool all right so i think that is all of our questions or at least it's all the uh time we've got for questions um i guess what should people go out and do now watch like after watching this what should their next steps be if they're either not using cat a unit catalog or even if they are using it and they haven't visited things yet what should people go and look at go turn on unity for your workspace go try you know Delta sharing is super easy to do. And uh, you know you can do it on day one of uh, basically setting up Unity. And then I would check out the access control and lineage, a couple of my favorite features there. Again, like super easy to get up and running. Um, so yeah, and tell us all the feedback you have. We, we love it and keep it coming. Awesome. All right, well, thanks for joining us. Thanks for asking all the questions. I know it's been very varied between business process to how tech works to how things fit into what the roadmap is, but thank you for answering everyone's questions. Of course, thanks for having me. All righty, thank you, cool. All right, so that brings us to the end of today's Ask Databricks. Hopefully you've got all your questions answered. If you've still got questions going into the chat that we haven't got to, we will answer those questions. We'll answer it in the chat. We'll get back to them, we'll round it all up. But yeah, thanks for all of the amazing questions. Uh, we're going to share some links in the various chats now in terms of where you can go for some demo material, where you've got some docs, generally where you can go to find out more and get started using Unity Catalog. There is a ton of stuff out there. And yeah, I guess all that's left to say is, yeah, come and join us next time. Uh, the next session is going to be on October the 18th, uh, and that's going to be all about structured streaming with Ray Zoo. So come and give us all of your horrible, gnarly, nasty Spark streaming questions uh, about everything that's going on there. It can be implementation, how you should use it, how it should perform, what the latest things is, anything about Project Lightspeed, I'm sure we can dive into. You'll see. But uh, yeah, hopefully we'll catch you there. We'll catch you next time. Cheers. <laughs>